the cuff. We try to pull back the curtain of entertainment of the of the wrestling industry, if you will. Um, but you can give us whatever Mike Skyros wants, if that's even your real name. We don't even know if that's your real. Is that your real name, Mike Skyros? Oh, okay. We'll just keep it there. All right. So what, what Mike what Skyros? Real? <laughs> What's real? <laughs> um, so we'll just keep it kind of right there. Um, yeah. <laughs> So what we do is I like to give the fans in our area, your area, people that don't know or never heard of Mike Skyros. If anybody watches this besides, you know, a couple of my friends at best. Um, so we'll see if we can reach some people and uh, show them the masses who Mike Skyros really is. And uh, this is going to be fun. And I hope you don't kill me because... Right after this, I got one Mark Adam Haggerty. So you got to be kind of chill so I, I can survive to the next interview. We're cool for now. All right. All right. We're cool for now. I can take that. Um, Mike Skyros, um, I just want to say, like, uh, Mike Skyros and myself, we have this hate-hate relationship wherever this guy goes. Um, but there's one place that he does attend, and his uh, – his, uh, evolution of his character if you will in that specific company tos test of strength now they make him kind of a face and it really pisses me off it twists up my mind because i love to boo mike skyros <laughs> you do you really do um when when you come out the curtain and you give us you know, I, I talk about character and stuff. That when you come through the curtain, you give the fans the signals that, you know, you you want us to boo you. You give us th those heel uh, signals to get on you, and you come right back on us. Is that something that just comes natural for, for Skyros when he comes out that curtain? Uh, is there a ritual that you got to do, or how do you prepare for when you're coming out of that curtain? It's tough because... The way I come out of the curtain is very much dependent for me on the situation that I'm in. So, say, like, when I came out at Survival Championship Wrestling, you were there. I felt very much like I had a chip on my shoulder, like I had something to prove. And to a lot of people, that attitude projects in a negative way. For me, it's not necessarily negative or positive. Um, I'm very straightforward and stern in those instances so it may give off that vibe at tos lately i've also felt like i've had something to prove but in a different way to where i thought there were things happening that were kind of unjust and i want to do my part to go against that so that came off in a more positive light to some people so i kind of go with whatever's going on and then it's up to you guys how you want to perceive it. I'm never going to tell anyone what they should think about me. It's your right as a fan to express yourself how you want to. So Mike Skyros is neither a heel, or a, a villain, or neither a face or a hero. So you're just your own guy, and you let us decide on the vibe you're giving us. Pretty much that's what's laid out with Mike Skyros. I wouldn't. Sort of. I think it's more so, to some people, I'm always going to be a villain. To some people, I'm going to be a hero. To a lot, to most other people, I think I'm somewhere in between. And where I lean is more so, like, up to you. Um, I never, like I said, I never try to lean one of those two ways too much on purpose. It's just kind of how I approach the situation. So, gotcha. it's up to you to decide. That, that's awesome because Mike uh, Mike Skyros gives the fans uh, a ride every single time. <laughs> every single time you come out that curtain, my friend, you um you get in that ring. And even before, just like I'm saying, you come out the curtain, you have a presence about you. Your gear looks uh, nice and clean. Uh, <laughs> you know when to react to the fans. You know when to do uh, no reaction, and you take care of that business as you're you're in the ring with your opponent. Um. I like to gauge uh, the men and women in the industry. Do you hear the fans? Do you hear our reactions all the time or most of the time? And do you feed off of that? Because some do and some don't. And some take it, it Some it takes a little bit to learn and adjust to that. So where does Mike Skyros fit with the fans? It's taken time for sure. When I first started, I felt I noticed everyone around me. But once I got in the ring, I felt very much in a vacuum in the sense that 
I was focused only on what myself and my opponent and occasionally the referee were doing. I think as I've done this more and more, I've become more aware of the fans around me. Like, especially someone like yourself or like uh, Alora, for example, where you're very loud, you make yourself heard and you make your presence known. I'll notice that more so when I'm fortunate enough to be in a situation where the fans are really with or against something, you definitely notice that, especially if you're in a big room with a lot of people, it's hard not to notice. I think most of my peers would agree um, that you become more aware of the fans over time. In terms of how that affects me in the match, it's, it's important to me to use it as fuel, but to not become distracted by it. So a lot of times I will shut it out, but mm -hmm. in a moment where I feel like it's giving me like that extra gear, I'll lean into it as much as I can. So sometimes you really feel it and you feed off of it. It's a, like a, like we do you guys and girls yeah. um, because of your performance and the story that you're telling in the ring against your opponent. Um, so it, it's cool that it kind of goes both ways um, inside and outside the ring as the performance is going on. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. And that that's amazing, man. I, I, it's cool that we get to be included in everything. And I know right now it's really weird. And I've talked about the empty arenas that's going on. Have you watched the product at all? And if you have, or do you even follow the product? But if you have, how are you feeling this whole empty arena thing that's going on right now? I keep up as much as I can. I think it's a responsibility for people in my position, if you, especially if you have aspirations of being a contracted wrestler, to keep up with as much as possible. I have watched it, and it's definitely noticeable that the fans aren't there. I think no matter what level you're on, we do this as wrestling is a storytelling medium and a method of gaining money. It's an entertainment industry. So mm -hmm. to be there without the fans it's noticeable. Um, I think it comes through the most to me during promos when they're speaking, they're speaking to a live audience on like a WWE or an AEW where they have yeah. those big home audiences, but a lot of other places it's, it's, um, it's a little more noticeable. Like when you, you see a lot of people doing these empty warehouse shows and I, I just wonder like, how how it's affecting them in the ring because I haven't been in that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, how long has Moonlight been in the biz? If you could kind of help the fans, I have been my wrestling anniversary. My first match was April. I want to say fifteenth of two thousand and fourteen. So we're coming up on six years now. Mm -hmm. it's it was a little touch and go at first in terms of I wasn't able to wrestle as often, but mm -hmm. that was my first match. Um, the character, the Moonlight Sun, because I am so curious on the moniker that precedes your name. Um, were you always the Moonlight Sun when you first got in? No? No. It, was no. it just Mike Scarrows? So, I played around with a, a bunch of different names, a lot of different approaches when I first started, a lot of different characters. And once I finished up with, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the promotion 2CW out of Syracuse, New York. It was, yes, yeah, they were where I got my start. And then once they closed, they were, they were in charge of basically what I did because that was the promotion that gave me my start. And I trusted their opinions, and they wanted me to portray myself a certain way. Once that ended, I scrapped pretty much everything I was doing there. I wanted my own name. I wanted my own style. And it took me some time to figure that out. I was Mike Skyro since February 2016, but the Moonlight Sun name came from a man named Jose Garcia, who has worked with XWA, who has worked with us at TOS in different occasions. 
And he sent out a promotional poster for one of my matches, and it said Moonlight Sun on the side. Because he always, like, he would make jokes that I looked, I reminded him of, like, a vampire, a werewolf, like an old, like, universal horror type thing. And I saw the name, I was like, oh, that sounds cool. Like, can I, can I take that? Can I use it? He's like, yeah. And then he'll always joke that uh, I'll owe him 10% of whatever I make off of it. And, always, and I don't know what I'm talking about, but he is responsible for that name. That's amazing because Jose Garcia is exactly who introduced me to the XWA. Yeah. And the XWA is the very first time I ever seen the Moonlight Sun Mike Skyros oh perform. You looked a little different in your attire, your hair, the whole, you know, the whole look was different. And yeah. you were going against Jay Freddy in a singles match, man. It was on a Thursday night throwdown. And I don't think the people really appreciated what what is what was actually in front of them at the time happening. It was Jay Freddy against Moonlight Sun Mike Skyros. I mean, I was there to see that a couple years back, a few years back. I think it was 2017, if I'm not mistaken. It was. It was. And um, ever since then, and I don't even know what it was because you did. It's not like he had a crazy flashy look. I mean, his hair was a little spiky or some crap, if I remember right. And he had some cheetah shorts or some shit. And but your move set, the way you performed with Jay Freddy in the ring, I looked at my dad because I take my dad to all this stuff, and I'm like, I'm down with that guy. And he's like, yeah, I can see something with you know something come out of him. And then later on down the road, you got to come in my area more and to the fans could you tell them where you're out of please so in my opinion i heard a quote from william regal a few years back and he would say it's he almost felt as though it was a cop-out to say something like oh the fans were tired or they weren't reacting or they, they didn't understand and i agree with that in the sense if the people don't get it, I don't think it's on you guys necessarily. If I'm that good, I should be able to take you wherever I want to take you. I was, I was, that was a time in my career, early 2017, when I was really like still unsure of who I was. And it wasn't until later this year, later that year, I had a few specific conversations with friends that led me to consciously presenting myself differently. I've always felt very confident about what I could do in the ring. I I am by no means satisfied, and I always want to improve drastically. But I've always concentrated on what I've done in the ring as opposed to my presentation, my promos, my character, etc. And I and once I put more effort into those things. I've noticed a very clear change in my career and where my bookings have gone from there while still concentrating on the stuff I did in the ring. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that point being, um, when I first saw you in in totally different look, um, it was a different feel from what I'm seeing now. Yeah. And whenever I seen you come in to test the strength, I almost shit myself. I was <laughs> like, are you fucking kidding me? They got Mike Skyros at Test of Strength. And there was a couple people around me that normally go to Test of Strength. They're like, who's Mike Skyros? I go, watch him. You'll never forget him. And now at Test of Strength, you've got a, a totally different fan base than from where you're based from, which, again, you said uh, Syracuse, Syracuse, New York, where you started. You're out of that area, and I see you out at those New York promotions a lot. What made you kind of come over our way a little bit? So, 2CW, I met Slick Wagner Brown when I first started out. And as everyone knows, Slick Wagner Brown is – the man that has helped TOS become TOS, basically. He's a lot of the brains behind the operation. I contacted him, and I was like, hey, man, do you know anywhere I could kind of work on my skills, get some more reps in, uh, wrestle more? And he's like, hey, come down to TOS. Show me what you got. If it works out, 
you can earn yourself a spot in the rotation, basically. So myself, yeah. my tag partner, Kevin Cartwright, went in with the intention to do this, just that, and it's worked out pretty well. Uh, mm. Back to what you said, though, the the character, it was a very conscious thing in terms of changing up all of that. Because I noticed that I wasn't connecting in a way that I wanted to. I don't think a lot of people understood what I was going for because I didn't really understand what I was going for. I had a few conversations with friends and they were like, who do you relate to? What are you into? What do you think is something that is a part of you that could project to the audience in that way? I know you're a rock and roll guy. Um, you're familiar with one Axl Rose of Guns N' Roses. Mm -hmm. When I first started out, I just tried to do what he did as much as possible. I would show up late everywhere. Uh, I had my drummer, Kevin, count me in to all the matches. I wore the leather pants. I did a bunch of air guitar and all kinds of just wacky, crazy nonsense. And that's toned down as it's become more like me, but that inspiration is still there. And then when I brought that to TOS, I've been able to work towards uh, connecting with you guys because the TOS fans specifically care so much about everything that's going on. They're, they're invested in the stories that are being told and that's made it a lot cooler for me to explore like what else I can do. Well, I've described TOS a couple of times, but for you, uh, for the people that don't know, TOS is, is set in a building. You walk up a set of stairs. You, and if you didn't know where you were going when you first get there, you have to call a friend how you found out about TOS yeah. and figure out where the F the door is, first off. Yep. But you go up a set of stairs. You go down a long-ass hallway. You take a left. You go down another long-ass hallway. You take a quick right. You open the door, and son of a bitch, there's a ring in there with like 30 seats, man. It's crazy. Yep. So it's like right on top. It's as, it's as on top of wrestling between the fans and the wrestlers that I've ever, ever witnessed and ever been be, been able to be a part of. Is that correct on saying, is this something in the most intimate setting you've been a part of at TOS? Actually, in terms of physical distance, no. So you guys are very close. We're all packed in one room. But I've wrestled at a few promotions like C4 in uh, Ottawa, Canada, that the fans are right up on the ring. Beyond oh. wrestling, the fans are right up on the ring. IWS in Montreal, very similar. Uh, you guys are very close, though, in terms of like both physical distance and... You can feel that you guys are right there. Like, there's an energy in the room. Like, us all packed in there like sardines. It's <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's like you're at something you're not supposed to be. Like, it's almost... <laughs> I don't want to say dangerous, like a like an underground, like, rock club or something, but, like, sort of that vibe. Yeah, man, because you're like, wait a minute. Th there's wrestling in this room? I, are you shitting me? That's that was my very first reaction whenever I walked in that door. I go, they wrestle in here. This is amazing. Not only do they wrestle, but they put on shows and shows that tell a story that they've built up over time. And what they do is they call these shows training days, and they've numbered them one at, one up to where I think twenty eight or twenty nine now. Yes. Yeah. And I'm telling you. That is some of the most fun at wrestling that I have because we are so in there together, man. It really, it's crazy over there. I love it. Yeah. No, of course. Um, uh, and the fact that so many of you come and follow those stories, like basically chapter by chapter, mm -hmm. makes it present so much more. Dude, that, and, and I say this uh, again in these interviews. Excuse me. Sorry, got to get a little sippy sip. Um, yep. I say stories and I try to discuss that with the men and women that I talk to because there's a lot of things um, in wrestling where it, wrestling comes in batches and eras, if you will, and things change, movesets and gimmicks and the way you do promos and, and the, the, the glitz and the glamour of it. It always kind of comes in little chunks of years. 
And as it's evolved, it's pretty nuts right now. Modern wrestling is not only is it a little bit nuts, but it's so flourishing and very plentiful and very available. Um, But uh, the storyline is what I'm driving at. I love to know that in another four Sundays, we are going to see (laughs) something that is, is continuing from the previous show that we get to look at. And then TOS takes it onto the road to the bigger shows. We as fans, some of us call it the pay-per-view shows. And then it even evolves more over there. So we, the fans, absolutely love that shit. And I can't thank you guys enough for giving us uh, that uh, that appreciation for your stories. Yeah. Uh, and thank you again. I know it is very common to say, but... Without the fans, especially as you see now, what, without the fans, what we do in the ring just doesn't mean the same thing. So it's awesome to have people there and invested. Yeah, man. Great, great times at TOS. Um, now, I mentioned you're out of New York. Um, I've yes. seen you at, let's see, uh, New York Championship, New York City Championship Wrestling. New York Championship uh, Wrestling. Yeah, I, I always mess that up. I don't know. I, I see yeah. four letters and it gets all jumbled up. Um TIW, Truly Independent Wrestling. I've seen you over there, correct? Correct. Could you name a few more? And where is your home base if you have one for a promotion, please? Man, it's it's tough. 2CW was always my home base. Since then, I've floated a little bit. New York Championship Wrestling was somewhere that was, I won't say home base, but a priority for a while. Mm-hmm. Immortal is another one that's a priority. TOS is a huge priority for me right now, especially with recent events. Excite Wrestling has been a priority for me. Survival Championship Wrestling, once that gets moving again, is going to be a priority because of how I've been treated there. All the places where you see me wrestling month after month, I don't necessarily call any one necessarily my home base, but it is where I've decided to plant my flag. So those are my priorities at the moment. Wow, man. And you named off some re- <laughs> really solid promotions. Yeah. Um, I want to touch I want to touch on the SCW Survival Championship Wrestling yeah. real quick because they were um they came out like a a, a cannon, like a a, a cannonball yeah. being shot because their debut the crowd came out for those guys. Yeah. And when you came out and I don't know if the fans were very familiar with Mike Skyros. If they weren't, or if they weren't, we gave you some fucking lava heat, man. <laughs> and you ran with it. It's crazy because I didn't do anything specific to garner that reaction. I walked out, and it was just instant. It was, like I said earlier, I felt very determined. I felt like I had a chip on my shoulder, and that came across a certain way to people. And if you guys want to boo me, like, okay, I'm going to show you why every single person in there should be cheering me. <laughs> and for some reason, that makes people boo more. So, hey. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a great time. And uh, I, I can't wait to see what the future brings to SCW because – and. I'm going to I'm gonna see if I can go through some channels and talk to the higher brass because they've yeah. got a brand new belt. And I know Garrett Holiday's the big champion. That's what you kind of look forward to. But yeah. they've got a brand new championship called the Collar and Elbow Championship. And, man, I think that would look amazing around the waist <laughs> of one Mike Taros. I agree. Um, I was one of the names announced for the match to determine the next champion. I'm not sure how that's going to be organized now that we've had all of this happen and a lot of shows are postponed. But what I do know is that I am going to expect to be in contention for that championship whenever shows resume. And I've had a, I've had a look, see at the, uh, the championship itself. It's, it's nice. I definitely want it. I want all the championships, but that one aesthetically it's, it's nice. I like it. it, it is- Sweet, man, the design looks amazing. And it's got because I, I obviously you would know who one Drake Evans is, correct? Yeah. Yes. Well, I was talking to one Drake Evans a couple days back on this, on the Stir in the Pot, and uh, we were talking SCW, and you know, he's like kind of one of the, pretty much the guy who takes care of the whole gig, right? 
Yeah. And uh, those guys are going to be moving full steam ahead once all of this can COVID bullshit. <laughs> can COVID. Um, yeah. Once all can COVID bullshit blows over, um, they're going full steam ahead. So I think you're in the running for that collar and elbow championship, but it has a lineage, you know. That thing is taken from like the 1930s, the name of collar and elbow. And I use the word lineage because of the Kowalski um, vibe that is set at test of strength. Yeah. I, I'm telling you, you have to become the first winner, and I will do. I will lose vocal cords, break a rib, blow my spleen out if you win that championship. I swear. Well, if anyone knows my history, the Kowalski lineage is something that's always very, uh, very important and very personal to me. Because of how I was trained, being a direct Kowalski lineage guy, that makes every part of that mean so much more. And I'm sure we'll touch on this specifically later, but that's why the K1 Classic Trophy, winning that meant so much to me. Because I never got to meet Killer Kowalski, but I always feel a responsibility to carry on a part of his legacy in a way that is... up to his standards so mm -hmm. anything i can do to hold up part of his name is very important to me i, I totally understand it and i think i got this weird notification if things happen i apologize i just gotta do that please i am so You're sorry good. Good. i'm so sorry i thought i took care of that earlier um when you won that and and since you did I, I'm going to jump right in there because okay. you mentioned the K1 Classic Trophy Cup that it's the K1 Kowalski Classic Trophy. I think that's how he said it. K1 I, I, Kowalski I'm, Trophy, yeah. Yes. I, dude, I, I, I got so much up here and Kincaid's not that bright and I get a little scrambled. Um, at Lone Survivor 2, you made... And I'm going to say motherfucking history there, baby, because holy shit, you went against in a triple threat, a triple threat against Sammy Diaz, who was the champion, the holder of the trophy at the time, and Brian Pillman Jr., and you came out the victor and are now, and it's treated as a championship. You are now the holder of that K-1 Cup. Could you please, I have been dying to talk to you since I got all up in your face when you were all up in the turnbuckle yeah. and you go three and I go, yeah. And you're like, yeah. and man, can you take us through that match with Brian, with Sammy? Um, I am so intrigued on how that day went for you and the match and being the victor and now the champion. Take us through that, please. Yeah. So in terms of that, I think it's fair to say that me winning was a surprise to a lot of people. I don't think, I think I was the person least expected to win that match. Not for me, but for the people in the audience and maybe to some degree my opponents. Because I knew going in, I'm, I watch everything that goes on as, at TOS. I know what Sammy is capable of, like, a lot of people don't like his methods. I'm not really big on his methods or his association with the firm. But I I can't take away anything from his talent. I said in the promo I did that I considered him the most talented wrestler at TOS, and I meant that. Mm -hmm. Brian Pillman Jr., his resume so far speaks for itself. He could very easily coast along on his name and the work that his family did, but he hasn't. He is someone who has carved out something of himself. He's working for Major League Wrestling. He works for a lot of companies around the country, and he is making himself stand out with his in-ring work. To win against those two, for even those reasons, without the trophy involved, made it very significant. But I knew that if I caught any of them slipping, I could win that match. And it was funny because I hit Sammy with that DDT and I crawl over the corner. I was asking you three. I thought Pillman was going to get there and break it up. He was this close. And winning it and finding out that one was all very 
overwhelming for me in the moment. I think it was very much written on my face. (laughs) The tremble of my voice when I spoke afterwards. I always forgot, too, that Alex, uh, the GM of Test of Strength, presents everyone the championships after the match. And that meant a lot to me because he's someone who I've worked very hard to impress. And all of that was very emotional for me. And it was very cool to feel like the hard work I put in specifically at TOS was recognized by them. It it was an amazing, I mean, you talk about, you know, your amazing uh, moment, the feelings and the overwhelming of emotion and all of that while you won that championship. That took us <laughs> on such a crazy ride because my my thought process was, well, Brian Pillman Jr., like you said, is working all over the country. And yes. that's not to say that he could never not win that championship and take it abroad, but we would never see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, yeah. we, so I'm not assuming that's what, was going to was going to happen in the outcome and then the other part of that process was Sammy's been champion he's part of the firm he's going to have one of his freaking uh, I I want to swear so bad right here he's going to have one of his associates come out and f up the whole thing and he's just going to keep that championship just like as it's happened you know but yeah. then Mike Skyros comes up with the one, two, three, becomes a champion. And I was on my chair. My first thought, I didn't even care what the hell was going on over here. I looked over in the corner and I seen you up like all in the, you know, like in, in the turnbook was draped over. And I, my thought process was I need to get Mike Skyros raw reaction right yeah. now, man. That was perfect. That was, and, you can't, you can't plan that out you can't write that like something in the moment like that is my favorite it's just so pure yeah man and dude i'm telling you <laughs> i i thank you guys so much because lone survivor was amazing but that yeah. fucking match dude you guys were the main event of lone yeah. survivor too man Had a lot to live up to yeah i i mean how do you make it better okay that's a fantastic question that you asked me <laughs> um how do you make it better? How does, uh, what do you do in your mind? What do you do with your body? How do you make it better, man? You got to, for me at least, I try to figure out what is, like, what is my my best stuff? And mm-hmm. I try and put myself in a position where my best moves can be used at the best time to win. And I hit Sammy with my best move at the end of the match. When he wasn't expecting it and it worked so Mm -hmm. in terms of that like you got to be ready to pull every trick out of your sleeve you got to pull everything that you have that you think is effective like and you just got to throw it all at them and see what happens and everyone in that match did that and when that happens it it just works like it all just worked that night it was fantastic um I, I do have a, a reoccurring nightmares because at that specific show, El Jabroni, all hail El Jabroni, he got his face ripped off and he's been uh, faceless ever since. Um, yeah, how do you feel? <laughs> how do you feel after winning a championship? Um, you, the adrenaline kind of wears down a little bit. Yeah. You're in the back. The fans are filed out. The, the the sun is definitely set because it's gone on to a different time in the evening. And you get in your car, and is there a moment where you're like, damn, that was that was fucking fire, man. You know, do you sit back and take that all in real quick? Or how, how do you process post winning something like that and being in a moment like that? It's tough because any of my peers that – know me pretty well know that i'm very pessimistic when it comes to my my work professionally and you will never see me be the person that's like oh that was awesome that match was fire all of that shit it's more so like okay i think we did pretty good today uh okay. i think our you know the 
the mistakes in on my performance were minimal but in certain circumstances like that i i always try and distance myself get some time to myself and really take in the moment because that was a big moment for me professionally and whether i was 100 percent satisfied with everything that happened in the match or not i could look at it objectively and be like okay we accomplished something positive today and that is one of the biggest rewards to me when i can look at a match and be like yeah that was cool the people got their money's worth and i think i did something that i'll be able to look back on positively in the future that's awesome man yeah do you you look back at footage after you know do you look at your matches because some guys refuse I've run into that. And are are you a guy that likes to look back and maybe fix things or kind of figure out what happened? Or I, I mean, yeah, it's tough because I, a lot of times it's like when you, I equate it to people when they have to watch video of like, if they're giving a speech or something and they see themselves talking, like, Oh man, I want to hear myself talk. <laughs> a lot of that is with our wrestling, but If you want to improve, at least for me, I have to go back and watch and pick it apart. And more likely, if I think something was good or if I think something was really bad, I will I will send it to a peer, someone I trust, someone who has done this for a very long time that can give me an objective opinion on it. And Mm -hmm. a lot of times people will go, Yeah, that sucked, dude. Like this, 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 and this. That sucked. It was awful. You gotta you gotta throw that out. Okay. And those are the times when I feel like I grow as a wrestler. Yeah. Because you take what they've kind of uh, seen and picked apart a little bit. And yeah. now they're giving you that that pure constructive criticism. And you take that and you utilize that to evolve as a wrestler in, in every facet. Am I correct on saying that? Yes. Everything, every positive jump i've made in terms of my wrestling my promos etc has been a direct result of someone saying like yeah dude you suck like you need to work on this and that's cool like sometimes it hurts a little bit but (laughs) if you have a bunch of people going around telling you you're good unless you're made of ending wrestlemania every year Mm -hmm. you're probably not that good and you're they're doing you a disservice by saying that everything you touch is gold well i I feel funny when when you guys and girls reach out to me privately and you're like, hey, so what did you think about my match? Yeah. And the memory of each match is a little different, but the end result for me personally, and I don't care about miscues or whatever happens in a match. I, that doesn't freaking bother me at all. I always come out with one thing, one single thing. My dad, too. We have fun through every single match. And that's what I come out with. So when when you guys and girls, when you ask me, the only thing that I can say, and I sound like a fucking broken record, is I had a blast. It was really fun. And I'm just being a yes guy. And I don't want to do that, but I don't also want to be a critic in your matches and then feel weird if I've said something incorrect or whatever. So... I hate I, I I just I just love all of the matches all of the time because I just have an effing blast, man. Yeah. I I agree. I think if you if you and if any of the fans or people that attend the show, if they leave and they felt like they got their money's worth and they were entertained and they had a good time, that's a success for that relationship. I think we should always be working to present something that's entertaining and enjoyable and compelling to the fans. I don't necessarily agree personally with seeking that criticism from you guys. I think that's something you need to go to appear with. And okay. I think that's more of a thing where um, I'm not going to lose any sleep if any one particular person was like, oh, that sucked. Uh, you botched this. Your move was this. At least from the crowd. I'd be like, okay, whatever. You didn't like it. It wasn't for you. That's cool. I care more so if those people are entertained by what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, it totally does. And, I mean, I would love to give critique, you know, if they wanted my point of view, but I just feel funny, like, 
I would feel weird doing it, you know? It's like, it's like asking me, like, like, hey, uh, did I do, did I wire my house correctly? Uh, did, <laughs> did I, did, did I perform, Mike, did I perform brain surgery up to your san- standard? Like, I don't know, man. Like, seemed good to me. It's, it's, not, it's not my expertise. <laughs> it seemed good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to switch because we have talked TOS. I want to switch to a championship that, if I'm not mistaken, do you currently hold because, uh, this whole mess has got me not seeing a lot of the posts and stuff of current events. Are you not a current 20? There it is. Are you not a current 24 7 champion? <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, is that at uh, New York? If Right? Yeah, it's Immortal Championship Wrestling uh, out of New York. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. When you guys put that storyline in where it kind of did a little hot potato, like, you know, you kind of did a little play on the r True stuff, man, I was watching all of that shit and peeing myself because that was fabulous, man. It's tough because, so, if you followed, anyone who's followed me for the last couple of years, about a year and a half, two years ago, we were doing a lot of similar stuff where we were going for Brute's championship belt. And then a little bit after that, the 24-7 championship came out. And we always looked at it as we were inspired by Crash Holly and the hardcore title, 24-7. And it became more of a thing of like, what nonsense can I get into this time? So (laughs) it's tough. It's in a tough position now because being the 24-7 champion, it's always going to draw a comparison to R-Truth. And he's phenomenal. I couldn't, I couldn't hope to mimic what he's done to the level that he has. He's off the charts, amazing. So I'm trying to figure out ways to do my own thing with it. I do have. No one has challenged me for it. At least with all this COVID going on, I think maybe it's social distancing, all that. Uh, but I've never been shy about saying whoever wants to try me can try me. Well, wasn't there at one point, where you, weren't you, like, sleeping or something and you got beat for the belt? No, I, I, w- I don't remember any of that, but I saw the footage. So I was <laughs> sleeping in the locker room. The dude picked me, gave me the worst, the absolute worst go-to-sleep I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and just, like, on instinct, I kicked out at, like, 1.75 and stumbled <laughs> off. I don't remember a thing. But videos out there on Facebook, if you find it, it's on the stepdad's page. And both of them failed to take it from me that night. It was ridiculous. Those guys, uh, speaking of the stepdads, I have them coming on in the future, like the near future, man. Oh, they're, they're Do you have a relationship with the stepdads? Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's yes. going on with the stepdads yes. and Mike Scarrows? Man, so me and the stepdads go way back. I've known, known. Both of them since about 2008, we were both a part of the same, like, online forum. And we all, like, were super interested in wrestling. And it was almost weird because when you have a friend that's online, especially when you're, like, a teenager, you don't think of them as real people. (laughs) And then I ran into them at some, uh, at a Warriors of Wrestling studio taping, and we've been cool ever since like we're fortunate to be booked on a lot of the same cards and we haven't always seen eye to eye professionally but i dig what they do i think they work really hard they drive tons of miles by themselves to try and get places and i would love to see them pop up more because i think they're very good but if any of them try me for my 24 7 championship it's not gonna happen Man, I tell you, from the time I mentioned the stepdads and your relationship, you've been smiling ever since. I've never seen you. You can't help it. Like they're they're just they're so just wild and crazy and like wacky. Like you you can't help but have a good time. Like when you're around them, both as wrestlers and as people, they're just they're just fun times. Yeah, and, and dude. I cannot wait because I don't know a whole lot about the stepdads. I've only seen them maybe t- two or three times at best. 
And I am so looking forward to that because they are some of the craziest dudes ever, man. They're coming to TOS whenever the next show is. I, I seen that. It was supposed to be yeah. at Dear Norma, right? At the at the, the, the next big show at the road show? Correct. Um I mean given the situation, we're gonna see how right. it all plays out, but yeah. I would expect TOS knowing them to honor that booking if at all possible. Oh, so since we're on topic, do they think they can beat you for the 24-7 championship at Tesla Strength? Is that even a thing? Can that happen? It could happen. It's it's 24-7. They they think they could. It's not going to happen, but they think they could. It's <laughs> funny. Like, ever since I got this, the within five minutes of it, every wrestler, referee, camera person, fan, <laughs> child, like they all they all want to walk up to me and say, like, oh, you know what? You gotta be careful, you know. What if I come after your belt and go, go for it? See what happens. Like people don't. A lot of the fans, I love them, but they will find out a very different side of me if they want to try me for my championship. It's not happening. That is one thing. I mean, like you said, I'm a little vocal at times. Maybe once in a while, I'm a tad vocal. Um, I would never. There's a few things that I would never. Okay. Uh, one of my nevers with wrestlers, I never swear at them. Ever, never do I swear. And I've got a mouth about me. I yeah. never swear. All right. And another thing is, I never would like touch Adam or anything, you know, yeah. in, in any kind of manner. Yeah. And ever, never, ever would I say, and of course, I mean, I'm like 120 pounds filled <laughs> with my pockets full of quarters and shit. But I would never talk like major real heat shit to a wrestler. I don't know how the fans do it. Do you run across that often at all? Uh, it's the thing is, it's mellowed out a lot over time. It's not like back in the day where fans would like try and stab you in the parking lot or anything like that, like in Memphis or anything. But there's always that one person that that thinks like oh, those wrestlers aren't that tough. And maybe we're not like 50 years ago when they were all like UFC-level martial artists or hookers or any of that. But I'd say the overwhelming majority of wrestlers can still handle themselves. The overwhelming majority of wrestlers get punched in the face more times in one match than these guys have gotten hit in their entire life. And I, I, I just don't think it's a good idea try and approach them on that level like i don't and that's a line that shouldn't be crossed either direction uh we shouldn't be putting our hands on fans as well mm -hmm. that's extremely unprofessional and i think we deserve the same respect that's a fantastic message and i don't think i've really asked anybody that um it just kind of came to my mind because when you're a villain that's very easy for the fans to get all irate and all in your face and swearing and spitting and all of that bullshit and I just find that that should be a zero, absolutely, a big circle with a slash in it. That should be zero tolerance between the relationship between fans and wrestlers and wrestlers and fans. I really, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all about that, man, you know? And it always seems to be like the scariest people they go after, too. Like they, <laughs> they go after all the monsters. Like, it's, I don't understand it. <laughs> um... I'm going to jump back because, you know, I'm a little flippy. I want to talk about the mask you came out in at Lone Survivor 2. Uh, if I'm not to, uh, to be correct, yes. th that has something to do with a Moon Knight character. Am I correct on that? Yeah, that's that's my boy. That's Moon Knight. He's a comic book character, a Marvel character that's been around since 19... I wish I knew the year. I'm going to seem less cool for not knowing the exact year, but... <laughs> been around I want to say late 70s early 80s and I played there's a game called Marvel Ultimate Alliance for Xbox that I played and he was an unlockable character I'm like man this guy's this guy's got it going on he's got the cool suit he's got the cool like weaponry and gadgets and all that and then once I delved into his comics I really picked up an appreciation for the character because at the end of the day like wrestlers to me always appealed to me because they were a lot like the comic book characters that I liked as a kid. And Moon Knight, just with his aesthetic, with his story, with his personality, really, like, captured my imagination in that way. So 
I got, hold on. I got a bunch of comics over there that I got to organize. Uh, <laughs> all Moon Knight comics. A couple fans have given me comics, which is super cool. A couple fans gave me Fungo Pops, the Moon Knight Fungo Pops, and that was awesome. And the masks specifically, I was like, man, this this would just be something cool to have for myself. And I just had it made. And then eventually I was like, just wear it to the ring and see how it comes off. I think, I think about it in the sense that if I was sitting in the crowd and a wrestler came out with a Moon Knight mask, I might be the only one to notice. But <laughs> I'm going to think that's the coolest thing ever. And I'm going to want to know, like, everything I can about that particular wrestler. And, like, I think if anyone in the crowd understands who Moon Knight is, they'll be like, oh, man. Because who else is doing that right now? Who else is promoting that character? I don't think many other people are. No, not at all. Um, now, was that the debuting of you wearing that mask at Lone Survivor 2, or have you worn no. it previously? I've worn it previously. I'm not going to I'm not gonna delve into my plans too much, but I have more plans for that, and I have more masks as well. So hopefully at a future TOS event, I'll be able to do something even more special than that. Just, just whisper it right here. Huh. You gotta wait to see like everybody else. Come on. Man, I can never pull information <laughs> out of you guys. What the F? We're oh a very secretive God. bunch. Oh, man. I tried. I, I, hey, guys out there, guys and girls, I really tried. You've seen. I mean, I, I tried. I mean, and I am not begging no moonlight sun. I'll tell you that right now. Um, what other championships do you currently hold? Is there any other, other gold in your uh, display right now? So I have the 24-7 championship from Immortal Championship Wrestling, the Dip and Donuts 24-7 championship. It is <laughs> fun. Uh, I have the K1 Classic Trophy that is defended as a championship from TOS. Mm-hmm. Technically, myself and Kevin Cartwright are still the NECW Tag Team Champions that we won the belts back in October, early October. So we haven't lost them yet. I don't know if they're going to take them away because they haven't had a show since, but we still have. (laughs) And that's all for now. I have a couple – I had a couple championship matches coming up. Hopefully I can add that Survival Championship Wrestling Collar and Elbow to the mix. That'd be cool. cool. Because outside of this, I haven't had my chance at gold much for a little while now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you've you mentioned your tag partner, Kevin, a yep. few times. And uh, that's where I first seen him is when you brought him in as your tag team partner. And then I started poking around a little bit. And you had some kind of weird ass no Kevin or something against Kevin oh, campaign man. going on. Okay. I, I have to know, and and I want you to explain to the fans, what the F was all of that madness? Okay, so this was, I want to say 2017. And myself, my tag partner at the time was Jacoby. And he's a guy that came out of the same school. He's a very talented wrestler. And we were tagging. And Kevin was trying to join our tag team. We were like, no, dude. We're we're a two-person act. We don't need a third guy. And he kept costing us matches and, like, getting in our way. We're like, like, just stay away from us. Leave us alone. Like, we don't want to deal. And then he managed to weasel himself in as a third man in, like, the six-man tag tournament. And he cost us the match. He took the pinfall and like we were like, all right, get out, leave. No <laughs> Kevin's. <laughs> no Kevin's. And then people started yelling no Kevin's at me, so I ran with it a little bit. And then other Kevins started getting involved, and I would go back and forth with them. It was, it, and Kevin Cartwright and I basically yeah. had a series of matches in a promotion called Grand Slam Wrestling in Pennsylvania, GSW. And we had this big street fight and kind of – we didn't settle our differences, but that was the end of that. We really we we gave all the energy we had to give to that, and he won. I lost, and I was like, okay, that's that's through. None of the other Kevins were able to step up to the plate and get a match. And 
That's not <laughs> they talked a bunch of crap and they weren't able to pull it through and get the magic booked. So whatever. Uh, and then a couple of years later, Kevin had my back. He was there when I needed a tag partner and we've been cool since. I squashed the beef with the other Kevins and that's the story of no Kevins. And you became a tag team with Kevin Cartwright. Could you tell the Heck. fans what it was and how, you know, and, and how it went with you guys? So what happened was we were in New York Championship Wrestling. We were the first main event of this show, actually, right here. I got the poster. Okay. See that? Nice. Yep. Yeah. So Kevin Cartwright and I, Kevin Cartwright, myself, Jacoby Reddick, were in the main event of their first ever show. And going forward, Jacoby told me, he was like, hey, man, no problem with the tag team, but I kind of want to see what I'm worth. I want to do things on my own a little bit. Is that cool? I was like, man, cool. I understand that. You got professional goals. I was like, man, they had this tag team championship tournament coming up, and I really wanted those tag team championships. I was like, man, I got to I gotta get a partner for this thing. So Kevin was the obvious choice, and it was cool because up until that point, not a lot of people had really given Kevin a chance even in terms of booking him, giving him opportunities, giving him matches. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm nobody, but I'm pretty busy. If me and Kevin can take this tag team thing around as much as we can, it'll help us both. And Kevin was the hardest working person I've ever been around. He was always there. He was always willing to go on the road for absolutely nothing. He put his all into the team. He bought into killer instinct as a team to see how far we can go and we didn't set the world on fire but we were able to carve out a little bit of success for ourselves we won two tag team championships and it was cool and i'm very proud of the the time we spent as a tag team and professionally what we were able to accomplish mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that you're still technically tag yes. team champions with him okay now say all of this blows over and the said company says, you know, you guys are still tag team champions because you own the gold. You're coming back in as a tag team and you're going to defend the gold. Are you ready to do that as a tag team killer instinct? That kind of remains to be seen because Kevin, Kevin moved away. He's been a little MIA for the past little bit. I don't know where he's at with wrestling. He's still mm -hmm. a good friend of mine but I don't know if that's something he would want to pursue. Maybe I could find another partner to compete in that setting, but it's, it's an unknown right now. Oh, okay. Since we're on that topic, what yeah. if the company, again, they say we're, we're, we're back up and running, you've got the tag team gold, but your tag team champ, uh, partner is MIA. We need Mike Skyros to get a tag team partner. Yeah. Who you got? <sighs> That's that's tough, man. Um, there are so many people that in wrestling that I respect that I think would make a good tag team partner. But I think the thing that would make it work is I have to find someone that I'm willing to – that's willing to buy into the team that mm -hmm. I have that kind of chemistry with both personally and professionally. It's tough. I don't really see anyone on my radar right now. What I will say is – at Immortal Championship Wrestling, myself and Isis FX have joined up to wrestle Johnny Moran and John West, who a lot of you are familiar with. Okay. That can work out. Isis FX is someone who's trained me, who has helped me immensely as a wrestler. Hmm. And maybe we would work as a tag team, but that remains to be seen. Got you. Um, I, I don't think I've touched upon this. Who were you originally trained from? Yes. So I was trained by Zachary Springate and Isis FX. Zachary Springate being the main trainer. The school is the Institute of Professional Wrestling right in Syracuse, New York. Oh, Part wow. of the Kowalski name is so important to me is that my trainer was trained by Killer Kowalski in the 90s. He is he's someone who has been around for the training of people like Slick Wagner Brown. And if you ask Slick, he'll tell you the same thing. So he's trained me, and I still train there to this day. That's awesome, man. That uh, that word, uh, Kowalski, or the, those two words, Kowalski and lineage, to the men and women that I know that uh, 
have come out of the Kowalski and, and, and the, the generations has been passed on. Um, they have, you, like, just as yourself, uh, you talk about that with such pride and such honor. Um, Killer Kowalski, he has left such a mark yes. on wrestling and especially our local, our industry, um, to make superstars that go and shoot for the, I mean, to the stars, man. Yeah. Is there anybody else that, you know, like an older cat that you really looked up to back then, you know, like when you were into wrestling, like a killer Kowalski or that, what type of era wrestling are you, did you dig? I'm still into wrestling, man. I'm, I'm a, I'm a fan and a student of the game forever. The thing like killer Kowalski was an undeniable international superstar and he had a certain way of teaching that translated and has continued to translate to the modern day. And I think you can see that from the people that have been associated with his name. In terms of older generation of wrestlers I've taken inspiration from, it's been a lot. Lou Thez, as I grow older, is someone who I nice. would like to, I don't want to say take from, but learn from as much as possible. I read his book, Hooker, which I suggest anyone who is a wrestler or intends on being a wrestler reads. It's crazy because his experiences in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s still translate a lot today. And that book completely changed my perspective on wrestling. And if even if you go back and watch his matches, the ones that are available on the internet, like, they're still applicable. There's a lot of them are still exciting. A lot of them still have techniques that would be interesting, exciting today. And I'd say above everyone else, in terms of a wrestler from almost a forgotten generation, he is someone that has influenced me. That is amazing because Luthez has touched many. I mean, I mean, with what he accomplished and has given to the sport but there's so many uh of the now generation that talk about Luthez even as the older generation does they all have that kind of same respect you know of a Luthez or a killer Kowalski and it's it's just amazing to me as a fan to see the generations change but still have that same exact love and that same exact respect for yes. what's come before, you know what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. He's the the archetype of the traveling champion. He would go absolutely anywhere and everywhere. He would make a positive impression while he was there, and he would make money while he was there. What wrestler doesn't want to do that? <laughs> exactly. Um, wrestling uh, again. I I I mentioned that it, it evolves in different chunks and different. Uh, chunks of years say five or some odd years and it kind of just has this weird transition that you you just kind of notice like all of a sudden it's like wait we're not seeing this or this is different and what have you do you evolve and, and i know you said you're a student of the game and, and you're a fan as well but is i should re-question that too is it difficult to evolve as wrestling evolves you find it difficult or kind of you just <laughs> mold it into it it's, I think it's definitely tough because you don't just want to be another dude like running in the middle of the pack doing what everyone else is doing. I think it is important to take, like when you see things change that you can use positively, I think it's important to, to add that to your game. But at a certain level, like you have to be what's true to you as long as it's like, if it's something, if your wrestling is something you believe in, something that you think is compelling and works for you and entertains people, who's to, who's to say it's wrong? But I think if you're going to, like, evolve with the times, it is way better to be ahead of the pack than to be, like, just another dude in the middle. Because when you see everyone doing the same thing, like, you don't stand out then, you're just another dude. And, and and I think that's why I've even grasped on to your character more specifically as you evolve, because like you said, you've changed uh, things and 
the the crowd has reacted to such your look, your presence when you come out of a curtain now. And um, I, I can't thank you enough for, you know, you have a vision. Everybody has a vision of their character, but sometimes yeah. it's not always what they want and it still needs to change and it needs to take on a life of its own for the fans to react. And um, I, I feel like right now, and I know it, it'll evolve even more later on in the future, but doing that, it gets our relationship with you and your character even more invested and even more involved. And I thank you for that because you're including us more into what you're trying to uh, portray as a character and a story, you know? Yeah. And I, I don't think it can be understated how much the voices of the fans, both individually and collectively, matter. I mean, obviously, if you're doing it in a way that's slanderous and disrespectful, maybe find a different method. But if if you don't like something, if you don't, if you think something's good, if you're meh about something that someone puts out, especially if it's a promo or a match or something that's being shared publicly, you can you can say something. You can message me and be like, eh, I don't like this, or uh, I think this is great. This is in the middle. I may say thanks and disagree. I may be like, oh, maybe that guy's onto something. I think every every person in my position is conscious of what the fans think, and every opinion matters. So you, you kind of keep an eye on the pulse of yep. what the fans are saying, just to, but you you filter well, it. You kind of if something it's it's easy to not easy over time it becomes easy to tell when something's working and it's the weirdest stuff like the 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 give me your belts thing the no kevin's mm -hmm. thing uh we had a thing way back in the day called winners give milkshakes like <laughs> stuff like that is when you f you see what people latch on to and you kind of got to run with it well it, it it's so weird because a, another unique thing about wrestling fans is we chant the most ridiculous things and you as wrestlers could tell us to chant one word and we just repeat it. Like it's yeah. so ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> it's some of the funniest shit I've ever seen. And you see it on TV all the time when it comes to the, you know, the bigger promotions, it yeah. happens just on the fly organically like that. But that's why I love that kind of shit because again, it's just so, raw and natural and it's not made up it's not written down it's not scripted or nothing you know yeah as much as look at look at any wrestling company or a, even any form of entertainment a hit song a movie you can you can tell people as much as you want that this is what you like this is what mm -hmm. you're going to chant this is this is the hit single you're going to repeat and it's up to them whether it works or not like You've seen stuff be shoved down people's throats in different amounts of entertainment, and it doesn't always work. A lot of times, it's the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, Some you're right. It doesn't always work 100% of the time. And, yeah. you know, and I li I'll, I'll listen to a fan trying to get a chant going on, and I'm like, the hell's going on over there? Yeah, I've, heard, <laughs> I've definitely heard those. <laughs> um, For the fans and Mike Skyros to connect to each other, could you give us uh, uh, your social medias so yeah. we know how to find one Mike Skyros? Yes, I'm very easy. My Facebook page is Mike Skyros. My Twitter is Mike Skyros. My Instagram is Mike Skyros. My YouTube, my Pro Wrestling Tea Store, all of it under the same name. So if you search my name, you're going to find me. And to my knowledge, no one has tried to take that name yet. So, All right. Well, I, I mean, Mike Skyros is your real name, isn't it? it? It's what people call me, so it's about as real as you want to say it. Is. Damn, I started with that, and I ended with that, and I still didn't get <laughs> shit out of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mike Skyros, um, this was a little bit different than I expected. I thought it was going to be a little oil and water. Uh, a little fire and gasoline. I didn't know really. We sat down and we talked about so much shit that I didn't even expect that we could hang out and talk about. Um, and it just kind of free flowed a little bit. 
And yeah. um, I really, I cannot thank you enough for your time for um, not only, you know, taking the time to do this, but you gave the fans that do know you and don't know you just more insight of who the Moonlight Sun Mike Skyros really is. And again, we pull it back. So again, yeah. thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate your time. Of course. And thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Stuff like this helps people get to know me, which is always good for me as, uh, as an entertainer and as a wrestler. And the thing about wrestling is you and I both share a common love of wrestling. And as long as that's true, we will always have something to talk about. That was a beautiful message to end this, my friend. And I thank you for that. Yeah. This is Stir in the Pot with Don Kincaid and my very, very special guest tonight. I can't thank you enough. I've said thank you a trillion times and I sound like a broken record, but I do. One Mike Skyros.